True freedom, the sort of thing everyone dreams of having in a video game. A vast open world, the ability to go anywhere, do anything, the feeling of living without limits, something you could only imagine. Only that idea of achieving actual true freedom within a game, it's impossible, right? After all, players don't actually want freedom. They just think they do. That is, at least according to many game developers. Why don't developers deliver on their promises to provide true freedom within a game? The so-called truth being hidden from players in the game development industry is this. Freedom doesn't work. Imagine your favorite game, a classic that has stood the test of time. What you'll realize is that game doesn't allow true freedom at all. Ocarina of Time is often regarded as one of the best games ever made. Only, it's entirely on rails. The whole game is experienced through linear progression. From the moment you start out in a small forest village, you are required to do set tasks to escape. Firstly, by obtaining a sword and shield in a designated area. It doesn't get better from there either. Each step of the way, you are expected to do a set task in order to progress. If you attempt to go straight to Hyrule Castle and kill the final boss, the game will physically prevent you from doing so. In fact, the final boss isn't even there to be killed. Don't be tricked into thinking these limitations are entirely due to outdated technology. Even modern games, with all their advancements, rarely provide the sort of freedom a player thinks they want. Breath of the Wild released nearly 20 years after Ocarina of Time and prides itself on an open world with a myriad of possibilities. Except what happens when you play Breath of the Wild is eerily familiar. A smaller starting area with a set amount of required tasks to escape into the wider world surrounding you. Even a game that revolutionized the expectations of an open world puts new players on rails until they are ready. But why do this? Wouldn't it be easier and more beneficial to let the players do whatever they want, whenever they want? Actually, no. And here's why. Every game developer has to knowingly or unknowingly deal with the problem of choice fatigue. You see here that I have an apple and I have an orange, but only one of these items will fit into my lunchbox to take to work. This is a simple enough choice. Imagine instead of choosing between two fruits that I know the properties of and how they taste. I instead have thousands of fruits, the substances of which are entirely a mystery. I could see them and estimate how they may taste or sustain me, but ultimately I won't know until I try one. A choice in itself is a discriminator against all other potential options. When I choose the apple, it is easy enough to forego the orange for another day, but foregoing thousands of potential fruits is overwhelming. Ultimately, if I want to eat, I must make a leap of faith of which fruit to go with. This leap of faith requires energy, the direct result of which is choice fatigue. Furthermore, we can imagine a similar analogy, where I'm in a large room with 1,000 different doors I can enter into. I do not know for sure where any of the doors go, but behind each of them, I discover a new room with another set of doors. You can see how maddening this process would be. A game with unlimited freedom puts the player in a similar bind. When a player first plays a game, they are in a vulnerable state. Just like a character in a video game, they have a limited amount of stamina. Their stamina depletes every time they encounter choice fatigue. Granted, every player's maximum stamina is a little bit different based on three independent factors. Their interest, investment, and time. A player's interest is their general affinity for the game. The game's themes, setting, and genre can all contribute. A game that isn't attractive to a player can significantly deplete their stamina. A player's investment is how much they have riding on playing the game. Unlike a free-to-play game, paying $60 can cause the player's investment to be much higher. If you are an achievement-oriented player and have beaten every Zelda game before Tears of the Kingdom, your investment increases. Lastly, a player's stamina for choice fatigue is affected by the amount of time they have to play the game. Returning home after a 10-hour shift with only 20 minutes to play a game before bed will result in less stamina for choice fatigue. 
If a player has no direction, or rails so to speak, that can help guide their choices, they will be forced to make goals up for themselves. This will cause choice fatigue, deplete their stamina, and result ultimately in one thing. Lao Tzu, the famous Chinese philosopher, describes how the constraints and limitations of a clay pot are what give it any function at all. The same could be said for the constraints inside of a game. Imagine playing chess with no rules. The experience quickly breaks down and becomes unenjoyable. The limitations and rules of chess are also what allows it to be played. This too is true for a video game. In a way, this is what players think they want when they ask for a game with true freedom. A game without constraints or limitations. Ultimately, this is an impossibility. This doesn't mean that freedom shouldn't be strived for or embraced in a different way. Only it's not freedom from constraints or limitations, but freedom from choice. Without having to worry about an infinite amount of possibilities, players can enjoy what they do have, following the path presented to them in their own way. Without structure, freedom can never exist, for it is within structure that true freedom is allowed to thrive. So where do I come in? I also fell for the freedom illusion when I first started making games. I tried to make a game where a player could go anywhere, do anything. This all started with the creation of Lionheart's Crusade. Instead of relying on clear goals and objectives for the player, I trusted them to figure it out and create those goals and objectives for themselves. By giving them a plethora of tools, mechanics, and abilities, I assumed they would create a path far more interesting than anything I could script for them. We attracted hardcore players who creatively figured out how to play the game. As I expanded my team and opened my mind, I slowly but surely learned that players need goals and a clear-cut central gameplay loop to keep coming back to. This would help us take Lionhearts to the next level. Imagine a medieval world where players make meaningful and impactful decisions that affect and change the very history they are participating in. This authentic experience would allow an entire kingdom to operate in a realistic manner with interwoven economic, political, and religious events that players, not developers, are making decisions about and operating through player-driven hierarchies and an economy that has true weight to it. What I'm describing sounds like a dream come true to many. Having an impact on the world would make every action and choice have weight and consequence. Only there's one problem the very freedom dilemma I just outlined. Can you really make a game that solves the problem of freedom and choice fatigue? Actually, you can, and we're going to do it with Lionhearts Reforged, a game that will allow for freedom within a meaningful set of historical parameters. The center of game design is something called a core gameplay loop. A core gameplay loop is a set of actions that are repeated that moves the player's progression forward. The loop we are designing is simple, Collect favor in your kingdom so you can ascend the social hierarchy and acquire rewards for doing so. This is the main objective, limitation, or defining factor of the game. The more clear and accessible the gameplay loop is, the less choice fatigue a player will have to encounter. It is within the structural loop that the player will discover true freedom. The first part of the core loop is gaining favor. Favor is a type of reward or currency you receive for contributing to your kingdom. There are three main categories of actions that will grant you favor, the first of which is military service. By fighting for your kingdom in persistent world territory conquest and skirmishes that have a real impact on your kingdom's wealth, land, and influence, you will be rewarded with favor. The second way to gain favor is by economically contributing to your kingdom. This can be done by harvesting resources such as at a farm, mine, forest, or elsewhere to give to your kingdom's stockpile. By growing the wealth and supplies of your kingdom, you gain favor. The third way to gain favor is through tithe and worship. By contributing gold to the church or participating in events at local religious buildings, you gain favor. Now that you have favor, it's time to spend it. 
This is where medieval parameters come in with the favor tree. Just like the methods of earning favor, the ways of spending it are split into three categories, military, trade, and religion. With each step up the hierarchy, you gain skills, abilities, and access to different sects. The sects are where the solution to our freedom dilemma is found, as the sects are completely player run. They are real societies in a way, where players, not developers, make decisions and set parameters and rules for themselves and each other. Although these limitations and rules can act as additional parameters, the player has the choice of which institution to be a part of, as well as their ability to ascend to the top of any hierarchy. The inherent meritocracy of these sects allow for the most competent players to ascend to the most free positions of decision-making and influence. The military side of the kingdom is run by retinues, or groups of fighters led by a lord. The lord serves the duke of the land, who then serves the monarch of the kingdom. Each of these roles are earned through merit, and each of them is a singular, real player. There can be many lords, few dukes, and only one monarch of a kingdom. This gives titles real meaning, and the players who achieve them a celebrity status and authority that has power and weight. Similarly, Trade 2 is merit-based and run by players. By establishing a guild as a patrician, you can enlist players under you to work on tasks for certain economic bonuses and resources. As a patrician, however, you still serve a magnate who reports to the Trade Master. The higher up the ladder you are, the more impact and sway you have over real economic decisions and regulations. Finally, the religious realm is similar. A patriarch of the kingdom's religion rules over archbishops, who rule over bishops, who rule over priests, and so on. Players are making decisions and ruling over local dioceses. Players are the ones influencing the world how they wish. These player-run organizations allow for the establishment of true freedom. The ability to pursue all three paths through the fifth tier of the favor tree makes choice fatigue unlikely. You aren't perpetually passing up early options for others. After all, there are a set number of paths you can take, but you still have the freedom to embody them in a completely authentic way to you. The last part of the gameplay loop is Acquire. By ascending the feudal hierarchy, you earn rewards, which can come in the form of weapons and tools, steeds and livestock, or most importantly, property, land, and titles. Because of Lionheart's unique economy, every item in the game has been crafted or generated by players, through resources of varying scarcity being collected. Steeds and livestock must be bred, through which certain characteristics can be genetically achieved. Finally, land itself has a scarcity, meaning a house, farm, or property with a physical location in the game will only have one copy and one owner, causing actual supply and demand value for real estate. These rewards that are acquired are therefore more valuable and meaningful because of their supply. All of what I've described is enhanced through a gold economy that, like the rest of the game, has actual value. Gold flows in and out of the kingdom treasuries, trade vaults, and religious fisks back to individual players. Each of these financial institutions will start with a set amount of gold to jumpstart the economy, after which no gold will ever be inserted into the game by developers through automated rewards. This will prevent hyperinflation and the devaluing of gold. However, as any economist knows, there must be some minting of new currency at a stable rate for an economy to work. That is why players have the option to mint more gold in exchange for real-world currency. It is important to note that no player will ever be required to mint gold to become rich or reach maximum progression. That is only how new currency is added to the economy. Through this prevention of hyperinflation, the gold retains true value and allows the economy to flourish. This exact system has already been implemented to great success in Lionheart's Crusade, which is why we know how it can work and how to pull it off. Gold is not the core gameplay loop of Lionheart's Reforged. Rather, it is a lubricant or enhancer. The economic machine continues to operate without it, and technically it will not be necessary for players to have to enjoy or maximize their experience. What gold will do, however, is allow late game players to interact with the world in a more meaningful, intricate, and exciting way. Furthermore, gold can be earned through weekly pay, something that a military, trade, or religion offers in exchange for services and jobs. 
This gold is then spent at the market, stockpile, through tithing, paying rent, or the purchase of land. These interactions are then taxed at rates set by other players, leading the gold back to the treasury's vaults and fisks from which they originated. Furthermore, gold can be spent on certain items, but can never be used to give an unfair advantage over other players in regards to combat. The weapon system in Lionhearts requires you to be at a certain experience level to wield a weapon to full capacity and damage. This makes it impossible for a new rich player buying the best weapon to compete with dedicated late game players. By providing a robust and unique currency, Lionhearts enhances the player's experience by facilitating a living economy, driven by the players themselves. Feudal hierarchy is the perfect solution for the problem of freedom. Players will have freedom within a real society, operated and maintained by actual players. Like the game of chess, limited and carefully crafted choices are there only to enhance the experience, allowing unique interactions and unscripted events created by other players. Not every player is granted the same responsibilities or power. These are earned through merit, competence, and fair play. The ability to interact with and between kingdoms will create a world that balances beautiful parameters with true freedom. So where do you come in? We've spent an enormous amount of time researching, developing, and planning to bring this game to Steam through Unreal Engine 5. A proof of concept demo is already in the works to show what Lionheart's Reforged will look like. After that, we'll launch our Kickstarter campaign for those who want to help make this dream of true freedom a reality. By signing up for our email list and joining our Discord, you can stay updated on our demo's progress and be ready when our fundraiser goes live. We've been testing these theories out and pushing the boundaries of player autonomy for years. Our team is equipped to design a game with the right parameters to maximize a player's experience while still allowing true freedom without being paralyzed by choice fatigue or disinterest. Just remember, True freedom isn't the absence of limitations. It's through embracing the right limitations that true freedom is found. I hope you'll join us on this journey so we can discover true freedom together.